We're actually really fortunate today in our inequality debate because we're trying to decide is inequality fair. Um, I'm not sure who's taking which side on that because I'm not sure yet how we're going to define inequality. Um, the two speakers today we're very fortunate to have with us Dr. Yaron Brook, the Executive Director of the Ayn Rand Institute, and he's the co-author of Free Market Revolution and the upcoming book, Equal is Unfair, America's Misguided Fight Against Income Inequality. That might be a group. Um, a former finance professor, Dr. Brooks' commentary has been published in academic as well as popular publications, and his op-eds often appear in major news outlets like Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, and USA Today. Frequently interviewed on national television and radio, and lectures regularly on capitalism, inequality, business ethics, and freedom of speech at college campuses, community groups, and corporations across America and throughout the world. Uh, thank you so much for coming, Dr. Pro. Uh, on my left, as he always is, um, <laughs> we have Professor, Professor Bill Marshall, uh, who received his law degree at the University of Chicago. He's currently the Keenan Professor of Law here at UNC. Uh, former Deputy White House Counsel and Deputy Assistant to the President of the United States during the Clinton Administration. Uh, he also served as Solicitor General of the State of Ohio. He, uh, he has published extensively on freedom of speech, freedom of religion, federal courts, presidential power, federalism, and judicial selection matters. Uh, he is a frequent speaker to the ACS and to the Federalist Society. He's brought in as their rarest of Avises. Uh, the person who can speak rationally to both sides without throwing things at them. Um, tonight we're going to hope to have a little bit of a discourse on inequality in America. We're going to have 10 minutes, stopwatch in force. They got me because I'm the largest member of the faculty. Um, so we'll have a 10 minutes for opening remarks, uh, followed by 5 minutes each for rebuttal. Uh, then we'll have the, remaining, the remainder of our time will be for a, a Q&A session. Uh, so don't have a burrito and forced nap. Wake up at the end of the uh, debate. Um, you may address questions to uh, either or both, both speakers. Um, if it's to one speaker in particular, the other speaker will also have an opportunity to comment. We're going to try to get out of here um, about 6.15 or so, so we'll have the full hour. Uh, and with no further ado, uh, we'll start with Dr. Brooke. I'm giving them freedom of the web. Yeah. Thank you. inviting me here. So inequality obviously is a huge issue uh, both in the political realm but also in the academic realm. Uh, it, is, uh, it is maybe the most uh, debated, discussed issue today in economics. Uh, major books have come out on this topic. You might be aware of a, of a book by uh, Piketty, the French economist that came out last year. It was an instant bestseller. Nobody actually read the book, but it was an instant bestseller. You know, Amazon, I don't know if you know this, but this, Amazon keeps track of uh, how much of any given book you read if you buy it on a Kindle, and they publish the 10 least read books uh, every period. And, uh, I think Eddie's Capital was one of them, uh, which made me pretty happy. But um, it's become a huge topic. It's hard to open the New York Times on any given day without inequality coming up in a major story as an explanation for all our troubles. Now, I think there are two primary arguments that the inequality, the people who view inequality as a problem, and I'm talking here about income inequality, wealth inequality, inequality when it comes to material stuff, which is what seems to be on people's minds. Um, there seem to be two issues that uh, people raise with regard to inequality. One is economic and one is ethical, moral. Um, the economic argument is, and there's a lot of idea that uh, the middle class has not improved its stake since 30 years ago. I mean, if you know anything about life in the 1970s, life is so much cooler today if you're middle class than it was back then. Uh, by every dimension uh, with regard to, again, the material stuff, that I think that's, a, that's just not a real argument. And then there is the argument that people at the top there's a significant number of people at the top who didn't earn it. Who are at the top because they've got political connections. They're at the top because they finagled the system. There's a real issue of cronyism in America today, and that is an issue that's growing in America. So there are issues with regard to how people at the top are doing. There are issues on how people at the bottom are doing. None of those issues have anything to do with the gap between the two. 
cares about what the gap is? If there are issues of cronyism, let's talk about them. Let's fix them. I'm against cronyism. If there are issues at the bottom, people don't have enough opportunities, they don't rise fast enough, let's look at it, let's study it, let's fix it. But the problem is not the gap. There's no economic hit theory, and nobody has presented an economic theory that says that the gap is what slows economic growth or what makes for a problem. There are lots of problems. Let's deal with the problems, but let's not you know, kind of escape dealing with the problems by looking at the gap. And by the way, and we can get into the details in a little bit, almost all of the proposals that I've seen to shrink the gap would do harm to the people at the bottom and harm to the productive people at the top of the income distribution. That is, they would restrict opportunities of even more to people of low income, and they would create even more cronyism at the top. Right? And if you want to know how and why, there'll be time in the Q&A or the rebuttals to talk about all that. Now then there's the issue of, so economically, in my view, there's no issue of inequality. There are lots of economic issues, but there's no issue of inequality in terms of how the economy functions. Again, there's no, there's no theory of inequality that says that it hurts the economy in some way. It just doesn't. It's, it's, there's no relationship. So I think the real issue is not an issue of economics. The real issue here is an issue of fairness, of what we view as just, as fair. It's an issue of ethics. And then the question is, of course, how do we define fairness? And the definition of fairness seems to have shifted, I'd say, over the last, certainly over the last hundred years, but maybe even over the last just 30, 40 years. Fairness used to mean like justice, justice and fairness often use a synonym. They used to mean getting what you deserve. Getting what you deserve. And in the marketplace, at work, what you deserve is what you can make. It's how productive you are. Getting compensated for the value you are creating in the marketplace. In the real world, some people create enormous amounts of value. Bill Gates has changed the world. All of our lives are different. Indeed, I don't know that there's a person on the planet whose life is not marginally better because of Microsoft. As a consequence, he's made a lot of money. A small business or a fast food employee is not changing the world. They're not creating that much value. They're creating very little value. Somewhere around seven to eight bucks an hour worth of value. And that's why that's what they're getting compensated. That used to be considered fair. You get compensated by how much you produce, by how much you create in the marketplace. Now again, we're talking just about material stuff. That doesn't mean you're not a good person or a bad person. It doesn't mean you know, one person's going to be happier than the other. They're not necessarily correlated to money. But when it comes to economic distribution, it was always linked to dessert. And dessert means productivity. Somewhere along the line, uh, 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 over time, we've come to the conclusion, no, equality now means, I'm sorry, fairness now means equality. There's an implicit assumption that equality is some ideal, some wonderful thing out there, that if only we could achieve it, that would be some kind of utopia or nirvana. I don't know about you, but I kind of like inequality. I like the fact that we're all different. I like the fact that we all do different things, have different skills, have different abilities, express them in different ways. And yes, some people get compensated for their skills disproportionately to what I get compensated for my skills because the marketplace values them more than they value me. Fine. LeBron James makes a lot more money than I do. And that's cool because I enjoy watching LeBron James. And by the way, I would like equality of basketball. I'm, I'm big on equality. I want to be able to go on the basketball court with LeBron James and play with an equal opportunity to win, right? Now, if you know anything about my basketball skills, which you don't, but you can assume, you know, I, I don't have a chance, right? So how do we make, how do we make the equality happen? How do we make the so-called fairness happen? How do you make LeBron James equal to me in basketball? You have to handicap him in some way, right? like breaking his legs, an arm might help me as well. 
But that's what equality always requires. It requires pulling down people with ability, pulling down the most productive, pulling down the people with skills so that we can all be equal at the lowest common denominator, which in the case of basketball is me. <laughs> There's no other way of achieving equality. It's about tearing people down, penalizing people for success, penalizing people for ability. And to me, that is unbelievably unjust, unfair, unwanted. So I believe that inequality is fair, it's just, it's right, it's moral, and that the people who are alarmists about the inequality are primarily motivated by an interest in tearing down success. They're primarily motivated by something that I think is pretty ugly, which is envy. Thank you. Hi, hey, thanks to ACS and the Federal Society for putting this all together. And really, thanks to your honor for coming here. He honors us for, for being here. And I urge you all to watch his podcast, too, because obviously in 10 minutes he couldn't present everything that he wanted to, to present. And it's really intellectually very, very, very much fun to, to, uh, to listen to what he has to say. Um, I'm not going to give a, a positive vision on the quality in that sense. I really don't have one as much as I have some disagreement with the way Iran just presented um, what he talked about. And first of all, let me say again, I want to celebrate just the discussion. As I told one of my other classes, my mom was a liberal Democrat, my dad was a conservative Republican, and as long as we could defend our belief, neither one of them were lawyers, by the way, so they were much more well-informed in the way they approached issues, but uh, as long as we could defend whatever position we wanted, we took it to heart, and we didn't feel like the other side was a bad person or whatever, and really it took many years until I realized how much smarter my mother was, but uh, <laughs> um, think about these debates in, in these kinds of things. And we're going to learn from each other. I mean, I, I realized after the thing when you're honest, I probably agree with him on a lot more than he thinks that I might agree with him on. I'm not going to deal with the economics so much, but I will tell you some of the reasons why people are troubled about the vast inequality that I think we're facing. One is, one is uh, the civil unrest that creates. The CIA looks at income inequality as one of the basic things to look at and figure out if there's a danger of societal upheaval. And I think that's something to be concerned about. When, there's the, when the haves have so much and the have-nots have so little, there is a real danger of, of, uh, of societal, societal unrest. There's a moment a morality claim here, a, a little bit of a, why do so many people or so few people have so much and so many have so few that I think, that I think uh, one, one can defend it on. But I really want to talk a little bit about what you're on saying is being somewhat inconsistent with where a lot of the policies, not necessarily that he supports, but that, that seem to be coming from that kind of view of the free market. Because what you're on really is talking about is rugged individualism, and the idea of rugged individualism as a way is what made this country what it is. And what I agree. What a great thing. It's given us our optimism. It's given us our sense of innovation. Rugged individualism is really important to who we are, who we are as a nation. But it has its limits. In, in, the, in, the, in the cases in the 30s when the Supreme Court talked, upheld Social Security, it talked about how when the country was founded, you always had a new place you could go to to start all over. You don't have that anymore. And that's one of the reasons they actually upheld Social Security. talked about uh, about polling, we don't have that kind of opportunity to redefine ourselves and start all over. Not only that, we need a lot more to be able to succeed in this society. We need education. We need we need other kinds of other kinds of benefits that society gives us. I think Obama misspoke when he said that nobody builds anything on their own. I, I think there misses some of the value of rugged individualism in there. But he's certainly right to say that those who make a lot of money in this country need our roads, need our communications, need our health care system, need, every, need our system of laws to make that possible. Bill Gates often says he owes back to the society. That's exactly what he's talking about, is that the society gave the infrastructure for, for uh, the entrepreneurs that you're talking about to succeed. 
And then we also see what happens when rugged individualism goes unchecked with the kind of abuses of Bernie Madoffs of this world that that creates. And the need to stop rugged individualism, what we're going to call that, from going forward. Now, it seems to me what we need to think of, and this is what I want to get to, to your mind, is, is that if you really took rugged individualism seriously, you wouldn't be talking about LeBron James. You'd be talking about Paris Hill <laughs> and, and uh, Conrad, whatever they use, Hilton, who've taken an infinite amount of money and done nothing with it and still have it. I mean, if you really took rugged individualism seriously, we have a 100% inheritance tax. But what I hear on the other side is they call it the death tax and they say there's something the matter with it. No, I don't want to break LeBron James' knees, but when I play basketball with him, I don't want, I don't want my knees to be broken because he started with so much more resources than I have. And, that's, and you know, that is the, the analogy, the analogy in, in, in place. And the other thing to talk about, by the way, is health care. Uh, you want to talk about basic opportunity and the idea of equal opportunity, what could be more important than making sure that we are, that we have basic health care to rely on so that we all can compete? You know, even if we celebrate, as we should, the idea that we are masters of our own faith, we are not the masters of our own health. And when we cut off the idea that everybody should have access to health care, that is the largest attack on the idea of equal opportunity that I think is out there because, you know, how many of you know people who had to stop their own education to take care of aging parents? Or take, or take, care, of, or take care of friends or take care of spouses who are harmed? Or how many of you or how many people you know weren't able to succeed themselves because they got sick? If we really took this notion of rugged individualism serious, which I think we should, uh, if we took that, that, that notion of what makes America great, then the other thing we should take seriously, and I, and I believe Yaron was referring to this too, is the idea of equal opportunity and what it means to create a level playing field. Not one in which we guarantee a, a, a equality of results. I agree that that's not what we're all about. And I agree that there are all kinds of problems with creating a system that's that equality of results. But there isn't one that talks about equality of opportunity, and that's where I think we're really coming short. And if you think that somebody who grows up in the public, in, in, the, in, a, in a rich suburb of Connecticut, has the same kind of advantages and the same kind of ability to compete as somebody who grows up in McAllen, Texas, it's just not there. And if we are going to, I think that your honor is right, that when the Bill Gates of the world succeed, it helps us all at some level. I don't believe in any trickle-down economics as an oversimplification. But it's certainly true that the idea that some of us succeed helps others, then we ought to at least provide the tools to allow everybody to succeed if they want to put that kind of work in and not let the things that unfairly and beyond people's control stop them from succeeding, from getting in the way. So that's the notion of equality that I'm talking about equal opportunity. And I think that's a different, you know, I think, I think that works with rugged individualism. It's not antithetical to rugged individualism in accomplishing or creating the kind of society that you're on is talking about. So, thank you. Two speakers who finished within their allotted time. Five minutes for a rebuttal. We both <coughs> equality. Oh, <All right>. yeah. <laughs> So just to sharpen the debate a little bit, because uh, it's getting too too nice here. Uh, <laughs> equal opportunity, in my view, is as false of a of an equality argument as equal income, because there is no such thing as equal opportunity, and you can't create it. It's again some utopian vision. The cat, the kid in the south side of Chicago, is always going to have less opportunities. Then, you know, somebody born into a family that's already well connected and can send them off to the University of Chicago or whatever, right? That's just the reality in which we live. We're not equal. Let's just accept that. We're not, and we're never going to be. But there is a sense in which equality is important. And there's really, in my view, only one sense in which the term equality is relevant in the political realm. 
And that is the sense in which I think the founders meant it when they talk about all men are created equal in the Declaration of Independence. And that is all of us uh, should be, the founders had to suffer the contradiction here, right? But all men should be equal in rights, equal in liberties, equal before the law. Right? We're talking to a group of lawyers, right? <laughs> we want everybody to have opportunities. They're never going to have equal opportunities. I actually want to maximize opportunities. My view is let's maximize opportunities for everybody. But to do that, we have to have a system that protects your right to your own life, your right to act in the pursuit of your own life. Now, when we try to establish systems that create equal opportunity or equal outcome, we by definition violate the principle of equality before the law. Because how are we going to create these equal opportunities? By taking from some and giving to others. There's no other way to do it. You're still going to knock down some people in order to raise other people up. You're not treating them as equal. So, it's not, it, it, it's not, you know, I want to get away from the terminology. I really don't believe in equality in, of any kind of outcome. It's equality of freedom, of liberty. Leave us alone, which is the rugged individualism we're talking about, is really a political system that leaves individuals alone, that doesn't try to interfere, that doesn't try to give us more opportunities, more outcome, less opportunities, less outcome. Now let me address just a, quickly a few of the things. Civil disobedience. As far as I know in history, there's never been civil disobedience in a society which has had large differences where the perception was that the inequality was just. When it's, the perception is that the inequality, the gap, is unjust, like 18th century France, where the king, right, the aristocrats had all the wealth, then you get civil disobedience. But in places like the United States in the 19th century, where there was a, a large inequality in uh, Hong Kong, uh, to this day, I'm not talking about this civil disobedience about democracy, I'm talking about civil disobedience about inequality, you don't get the civil disobedience. I, I don't think civil disobedience, I think it's, a, it's a, a rationalization. Now, there is a perception today that that gap is unjust because of cronyism. We can discuss cronyism. I'd love to. That needs to be dealt with. But it, it, it's, not, it's not the inequality again that's the problem, it's the cronyism that's the problem. Uh, roads, communication, the you didn't build that. Well, yeah, of course, we all use roads that other people build, but you know what? For the most part, we all pay for them. Bill Gates didn't create Microsoft by himself, he had lots of employees, they all got paid. More millionaires were created in Microsoft than any company in human history because they got paid well for the contribution they provided. And you know what? His taxes, even the minimal amount of taxes that he paid, paid for those roads, paid for those schools, paid for those teachers. People, it's not like there's free stuff out there because there's nothing that's free. As Milton Friedman said, there's no free lunch. Somebody pays for it. It might be free to you, but somebody pays for it. And Bill Gates and, you know, the 1% pay disproportionately for the infrastructure that many of us actually use for free because many of us pay a lot less taxes less taxes than it would cost to actually provide that infrastructure. And, you know, we could have a debate about whether that infrastructure should be private or public, which is a whole other topic. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, I'm glad we aren't going to be nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> always, a good place, always a good place to go. Um, so let's deal, with, let's deal with some of the points that your mind just made. I mean, you said that, yeah, nobody in the south side of Chicago is ever going to get the same kind of opportunity as some going up in the, in the Chicago suburbs. And I'm, you know, I, can we create an exact opportunity ground floor? No, but I think we can create a floor of some kind of opportunity. But, what, but let's take his argument seriously and say, okay, we are going to have a system where we know that people are going to be frozen into certain kind of economic strata and other people who are not. Well, it seems to me that is the kind of unjustness that does create social unrest. And if we say we don't really care about the fact that we know that there isn't going to be certain economic opportunities for people in Appalachia or people in the inner cities, that creates the problem of civil unrest. And by the way, the I love your example of the 19th century because the response of, in 19th century America was the creation of the income tax and the busting up of 
the large antitrust, antitrust thing. There was a political response to that kind of inequality. It didn't lead to it didn't lead to civil unrest, but it didn't lead to people patting themselves on the back and saying, "What a great system we have!" Because the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. It led to legal redress of those particular kinds of concerns. I mean, one of the areas where, where I think I think that the guy I might disagree is he talks about the value of people as being established by the marketplace. So he used the example in his initial remarks about uh, Bill Gates has made hundreds of millions of dollars and somebody making seven bucks working for working for McDonald's. And we can ask ourselves, is the free market really all that good in in, uh, in providing, in attaching worth to what people do. Is it really true that a hedge fund manager is worth 200 times what a teacher in the south side of Chicago is making in trying to, in trying to help folks? Is it really true that the market is giving us an accurate representation of the value that people pose to society? Now, your answer is probably going to be, I don't know if that's true or not, he might say, or these folks coming in, but the market does that, and we shouldn't second guess the market, because that's better than having government make those kinds of choices. Except it's not really true that the market makes all these kinds of choices. Because in a large issues of wealth, it's done by management and corporate structures. I mean, look what happened after, after, a, after a Wall Street brought us into that economic depression that we had in 2000, 2007, and 2008. They all got raises. And, the, and they all got bonuses. And the reason why that happens is because ownership is so distant from, from management right now that there is no market check on that, except that except what works in a very insane <laughs> part of, of the economy in New York. So you can't convince me either on the grounds of looking at the value of people's worth to society or the grounds that the free market is actually making free choices to say that this kind of economic differential is fair. And yes, it's true at his last point that everybody pays taxes, um, and so that's where the wealth is coming from. But one of the questions we have to ask is, is this a fair tax system? When it's pointed out, heads of corporations, uh, people making a lot of money, paying a less effective rate than the secretaries who are working for. There's something that's wrong. There's something that's wrong here. The market isn't working in the way that he's talking about. I mean, you know, one of the, I read Ayn Rand when I was a kid too. I love it. I mean, it's great. That sort of image of, of freedom, I think, is a valuable image. But it has to be tempered by a sense of reality and how it works in the world. And if everybody was an Ayn Rand in this world, the society would fall apart in an instant. I think what you'll do is what all professors do, is then sneak your rebuttal well, you into answer the questions. Well. <laughs> um, and so we're going to open the floor up to uh, questions here. Uh, I, I am struck that some of these things seem to be questions about the appropriate level of abstraction um, and what principle it is we're uh, coming to, and that there might be uh, responses where both of you would agree about the nature of the problem, for example, the cronyism issue, uh, but be coming at it from opposing ends of the political spectrum about what the correct response is and where the problem lies to begin with. Uh, so I'm really interested in a joint meeting between the American Communist Society, uh, the Constitutional Society, uh, and the Federalists uh, to see how we, uh, how we, what we think, whether or not government is the problem or the solution, um, and whether or not we can fairly define the problem. So with that, I will open it to the floor. Let's start here. Um, for professional purposes, <laughs> um, you know, I'm interested in the Their, as their market value, as their value to the market. Well, I've said that, that the current salary structure doesn't yes. necessarily reflect the value but that people have. Right? I guess my question is, is, is other, than a, other than a market value, what objective, um, objective gauge of one's value would you? Sure. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, right? what, what Richard just said a minute ago is, 
Yeah, and having government come up with a wage schedule isn't exactly going to be a perfect, a perfect result either. I, 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 have no, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, the problem is it's not that is government the solution or is government the problem. The government is both the solution and the problem, and private industry is both the solution and the problem. Private industry doesn't work to curb environmental harm because it's not in private industry's economic interest in doing that. We can't have a government wage system to do it, but we can acknowledge the fact that maybe the wage system doesn't work effectively in doing everything that you're on saying and when we come up with an idea of what taxation should look like, for example. So I'm not in favor of some sort of utopian evaluation of a teacher working on the south side of Chicago versus a hedge fund manager. But I am suggesting let's start with the proposition that we know that the wage system isn't necessarily reflecting the value to the society uh, as a way to sort of evaluate this economic inequality issue. So I, I guess I, partially I take, I take uh, um, you know, this question of value to society. I don't know what that means. There is no society out there that we can value. The question is if I'm selling a product, is, am I providing a value to some people? And how much money I make is going to reflect how much value I'm providing to those people and how many people I'm providing that value to. That's the only value there is. It's, it's value between individuals. There's no algorithm out there to calculate social value. And it, when we try to do those calculations, it's very, it's very dangerous. And at the end of the day, I think the weight system, called the weight system, is quite good. It's quite good at reflecting. Hedge fund managers make a lot of money because there are a lot of distortions in the market, primarily created by government manipulation, that need to be taken care of so that the allocation of capital is more efficient, which all of us benefit from, by the way. And I, I'll, any day, if you want to invite me back to debate hedge funds, I'd be happy to do it. Um, and it, last I looked, uh, except for one or two cases, every CEO on Wall Street uh, was fired after, after the financial crisis. Financial crisis, that again, I've done many debates on this, was caused by... Uh, government, and yet no government, not a single government regulator, not a single government politician lost his job on the country. The two guys most responsible for it, Dodd and Frank, got a big bill named after them and are considered heroes. And yet they are more responsible for the financial crisis than any CEO. So if we're talking about uh, retribution, the market is so much better at uh, you know, getting rid of people who do harm than is government. Government keeps them there forever for, you know, they get lifetime jobs. Uh, Professor Bro Bro Dr. Bro I had a question for you. You said that your one of your in creating an equal playing field and creating equal opportunities that you have to take from someone though to bring the same thing. Uh, to create inequality as we currently have it, you have to take from someone to bring that to create that inequality. People yeah. lost something for that inequality to be sustained. Uh, American ruggedness was not just what created America. America taking from other people to created that. So how do you reconcile that? How do you? So I don't accept your premise. That is, uh, well, I'm not going to say there weren't any injustices in American history. Obviously, they were. Uh, the world is not a sewer sum game. That is, the wealth is not about taking from other people. We today in the world are far, far, far richer by I mean, it's, it's hard for you to, and all of us to imagine how much richer we are than we were 250 years ago, as, as, as a, the whole world, right? We didn't take it from anybody. There are no aliens from which we stole. Wealth is created. And we are richer. The people who are richer today didn't take it from other people. They created new wealth that didn't exist before. Now, are there injustices in the past? Yes. Uh, slavery, uh, certainly what was done to American Indians, but that doesn't explain the wealth that we have today. If anything, that retarded wealth. Uh, it, it didn't increase wealth, it retarded wealth. There's a reason why the North was richer than the South and won the Civil War, because it, it didn't have slavery. Not having slavery encourages freedom, encourages people to work harder, encourages production. It became more industrial, and therefore it became richer. And that's why it won the war. Other than, it, of course, it was white, which uh, one, one would hope the white side win, wins all wars. It doesn't always happen that way. So I don't buy into the zero-sum game that, that you're hypothesizing. Wealth is not an issue of redistribution. Wealth is something to be created, at least under freedom. Now, pre-freedom, pre-capitalism, pre-industrial revolution, we had a zero-sum world. The wealth was very, I don't know if you've ever seen these, these wonderful income and wealth graphs that go back 10,000 years. And they measure 
uh, human wealth, the human income, 10,000 years as today, and it, it, the graph is basically flat. It goes up a little bit, down a little bit, and then in 17 something, it goes like that. It goes suddenly through the roof. And in Asia, that doesn't happen. In Asia, it stays flat, and somewhere by 1970 something, it goes like that. And what happens is when you institute freedom, when you institute capitalism, the ugly word that so many people fear, wealth suddenly explodes. Not because it's taken from somebody, but because it's created. I just read a story, the World Bank just today came out with a, with a statistic. For the first time in human history, uh, less than 10% of the planet, of the human beings on the planet, live below what is defined as extreme poverty. That is to be celebrated. That should be a headline in every newspaper, of course it won't, because nobody wants to talk about it. But why is that? Because India and China and other places in Asia and some places even in Africa have adopted elements of capitalism and suddenly they're richer for it. So it's, it's, they haven't taken anything from some way they've created out of nothing. Of course they've taken something away from it. I mean, you know, <laughs> obviously when you use labor, you don't have to say it's complete exploitation, but, but you're not doing it by yourself. You need people there that you're, that you're using as a labor force to be able to build what it is that you want to build. And there is, I think that's what Bill Gates talks about, and part when he talks about giving it back. It's because of the, the structure of the society, because of the availability of the workforce, and the use of that workforce, that you've been able to amass that wealth in the first place. So taking some of that back is just a reflection of the fact that it's not as individualistic as we would like to assume that it is. I think it, the, the, the myth of rugged individualism is an important myth and ruthless, but it's not like anybody did it on their own. They needed to have, and I think that's your point, I think they needed to have other kinds of resources. They need to be able to use the society and what was there to be able to particularly build that wealth. I don't think we ought to build an economic structure on that alone. I think we ought to recognize the value of individual and entrepreneurship um, but we certainly should recognize that that's a part of it when we're thinking of this overall question of income inequality. Um, so, Mr. Brooks, you say that uh, equality of opportunity is not necessarily a good thing, but I, I believe that uh, the opportunity cost, of, if you look at the body, the, the proportion, so the more people are that poor kid from the south side of Chicago than are Bill Gates, if we assume that um, smart people don't just come from rich people, you know, the, the services that a productive person gives back to society, you say that it's measured in what they can create. If you don't have equality of opportunity, how then would you say that they're able to put back into society? Also, I think that um, your point about Bill Gates is actually very interesting in this respect, since that Bill Gates' company was convicted of antitrust measures. And you say that you're against cronyism, and yet Bill Gates was a you know, uh, private school kid that ended up using monopolistic tactics to make his wealth. So I wonder how you recognize So two that. questions. Let me try to uh, separate them out. I'm, I'm, I'm eager to answer the antitrust one, but I'm, I'm going to, I mean, at law school, so I have to be careful. Um, <laughs> um, so let me, let me answer the first one first. Um, look, counted the way it was presented, I don't believe in static equal, uh, economic classes by any means. I actually believe strong I think the evidence is on my side on this. That if you take away the rhetoric of equal opportunity, and you take away the rhetoric of equality of outcome, you take away equality out of the picture, you give, you're giving more opportunities to, to poor kids than you would otherwise. So in the, the, all, of the, uh, all of the policy proposals of the people who advocate for equality, whatever kind of equality you want, actually institutionalize people into poverty more than my proposals. No system in human history, as is illustrated by what's going on in Asia, I think, right now, no system in human history has provided more opportunities to rise up from poverty than a system of freedom where the government doesn't intervene in our business lives, where the government leaves us alone, where the government doesn't try to establish equality of opportunity. You want equality of opportunity, and I'm going to say something that's like, like a thousand times more radical than anything I've said so far, so be ready. Get rid of public education. Because public education doesn't give equality of opportunity. What it does is institutionalizes bad education for, for, for poor kids. Look at the south side of Chicago. Go look at the schools in the south side of Chicago. It is one of the tr great travesties of this country that we have such awful, horrific educational institutions in the poorest neighborhoods where they can least afford to get a bad education. 
Now, if you privatized education, and you got competition for those kids, and you got corporations looking for those smart kids in the inner cities, giving scholarships to those kids, starting schools in those kids, which I have no doubt would happen, the quality of education in the inner cities would go up astronomically. It's unimaginable how good of an education they would give. So my view is when the government gets out of the way, when you have freedom, you maximize opportunities. I'm not for equality of opportunities. I think that's too shallow. I want to maximize opportunities. I want, I want kids to have as many opportunities as possible. I'll give you one other example, and then we'll go ahead and first. Um, minimum wage. There is no worse law on the books of this country than the minimum wage, and it's so enthusiastically embraced, now we're raising it. This is a law whose sole purpose is to make inner city kids unemployable. Now, nobody will admit that, but that's why it was instituted. It was instituted by racist white union bosses who didn't want competition from, uh, from minorities because it prices them out. The whole point of minimum wage is when you take a price and you artificially raise it and you set it as a minimum price, demand for that product goes down no matter what product is. When you do that to labor, demand for that labor goes down. So what happens when you raise the minimum wage, demand for unskilled labor goes down. And this is like the law of gravity. This is not debatable. This is not up for empirical evidence. This is a law of economics equivalent to the law of gravity. So when you raise the minimum wage to $15, what you're doing is you're telling an inner city kid you'll never have a job. Because you're not going to be producing at 15 bucks an hour unless you start it five, six, seven, and work yourself up. But you can't start at five, six, seven. Now you, I'm assuming most of you are wealthy kids, not all of you, but some of you are wealthy kids. The wealthy kids among us. You can, you can go do an internship. How much you get paid for the internship? Zero. My son does comedy in, in Hollywood, right? He's a, he's, a, he's a comedy writer. You know how much he gets paid? Zero. Right? Nobody, nobody's insisting on minimum wage for internships and, and comedy writers, no, because those, are, those tend to be middle class kids. No, we, we want to we have a minimum, because we know that if we insist on minimum wage, the internships would go away. And we don't want that. But we're willing to take away jobs from inner city kids. That to me, ugh, nothing makes me more angry than that. Because I care about those kids. And I care about the next really smart kid who could own a franchise, who could build a franchise, could build a business. But if they never get that first job, they'll never have a life. The first job is so crucial. Antitrust. Before we go to yes. antitrust, okay. response, and then we'll come back to antitrust. Very little we'll talk about in getting rid of the minimum wage laws in public education. <laughs> <laughs> that response? No material. <laughs> Not that that and your softball there. Yeah, right. <laughs> you did. Um, for, on a couple, on a couple of accounts. A minimum wage. A minimum wage, for example, what's the reason why minimum wage was built in? Because in an, I'm not an economist. You're going to be able to kick my butt after across the continent on a particular <laughs> one. But there are economic reasons for it, including the fact that you, when it could be a race to the bottom when you have more employees than you have, uh, than you have jobs available, and that can depress. And so part of the idea of minimum wage is to fight against a depressed wage structure. There are some laws which I think are better, which are which work to exempt students from some of these things, and there can be a fix on minimum wage laws to deal with some of the issues that you're talking about without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. With respect to public education and competition, you know, one of the problems with respect to that is is you're going to have to fund that at a really high rate. So whether you're paying, whether you're going, well, who's going to be paying for the tuition for the kids, for the families that don't have any money to pay for tuition? You're going to have the government. Can I give a simple example? About your system. Can I give a simple example? In the city of Chicago, to send a kid to a public school in the city of Chicago costs the city of Chicago sixteen thousand dollars a year. You can you can check this out it's online. For the Catholic diocese, and I'm not a big proponent of Catholic schools because I'm not religious, but for Catholic diocese, it costs seventy five hundred dollars to send. Yeah, and I think Catholic right. schools. And if you had innovation, and if you had competition, if you had entrepreneurs going to education instead of into the next stupid little app for the iPhone, the cost would drive down, and you would make them more affordable. And cost go down, quality goes up. Well, we'll see how well the charter school system is working. It's that mixed report so far. What it does do, and what the voucher system does do, is bleed the public school system so that the resources aren't placed into the public school system that need to be there. And we've had a bleeding of public education. I think there's some, obviously, some good points to be made about the inefficiency of public education. But public education has also provided the basic cornerstone of how we got 
to where we got in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And we haven't funded it. We haven't created the system that makes it work. But even if we go to a system that you're talking about, you're still going to have to tax folks to pay for to pay for whatever voucher system or whatever system that you're going to create. That is going to be an attack, the way you phrase it, on equality because we're going to have to tax those who are making more money to make that system to make that system viable in any real sense and to give these these folks any kind of opportunity. I'm going to artificially depress the marketing questions about antitrust in the false equation.